the Dhammapada it starts with two verses on the topic of the power of the mind. The mind is the forerunner of all dhammas. The mind is chief. They're made of the mind. And we may say on one level that well, it sounds reasonable. The way you look at things, the way you act, will have an influence on what you experience. But it goes a lot deeper than that. Everything comes out of the mind. Everything you experience comes from the fact of fabrication. And dependent core rising, that's even prior to the six senses. We tend to think of the mind as being something passive, receiving input from outside and then responding in the old stimulus response mode. And we have some role in shaping things outside. But that view is much too passive. Things start with the movement of the mind outward. And that's where all the trouble comes from. And so that's this problem that has to be solved. As the Buddha said, everything is rooted in desire. All dhammas are rooted in desire. And you look at the Four Noble Truths, the causal truths, i.e., the second truth and the fourth, the cause of suffering and the path to the cessation of suffering, are actions. There's the action of craving and clinging. There's the action of the desire and right effort. So the question is, which desires are we going to follow? And how deep does it go, this question of how the mind is shaping things? It goes a lot deeper than you might think. This is why insight comes from asking questions about actions. Because the results of actions are pleasure and pain. And the Buddha says, look at that pain. Where is it coming from? What's the cause? And he says, look into the mind for the cause. Of course, to deal with pain, we have to have a sense of pleasure someplace as our foundation, which is why we practice concentration. Right effort leads to right mindfulness. Remember, remembering to give rise to skillful qualities and remembering to try to abandon unskillful ones. The right mindfulness then forms the theme around which right concentration develops. So this desire to put an end to suffering leads to mindfulness, leads to getting the mind to settle down and be really still with a sense of well-being so that it can look at what else is going on on a deeper level. The greater the stillness of the mind, the more subtle things you'll see, the more subtle movements of the mind you'll be able to see. You keep wanting to ask, is there any rise in the level of stress? Any lowering of the level of stress? And if you can catch that, you ask yourself, then, what did I just do? What arose together with the stress and what passed away together with the stress? This is why the cause of stress is called samudhiya, something arising together. Because after all, part of your experience is based on past actions. And it's hard to see sometimes the relationship between a past action and a present one. As the Buddha said, the workings of karma are really complex. And sometimes an action, maybe not just from one previous lifetime, but from lifetimes before that. Now you're going to track that down. But what you can track down is what you're doing right now. And as I said, in dependent arising, what you're doing right now, the fabrications that, that usually come out of ignorance, come prior to input from the senses, even the sixth sense, i.e. the mind. So you're already shaping things before you have any input at all. And what we're trying to do is shape things with knowledge, shape things with awareness, alertness. That's what the questions do, because otherwise you just go f flowing through the various causal links in the chain without paying much attention. It's become so natural that we don't see the extent to which we're fabricating things. 
It's only when you ask questions that you begin to notice, oh, there was something happening there. Oh, I did this. And this resulted. So learning how to ask the right questions at the right time is an important part of gaining discernment. The Buddha said that's a sign of a person of discernment, is how they approach a question, how they frame the question, how they apply it. That applies not only to the discernment about understanding how to explain things and how to ask questions about things you've heard explained, but also how to question your own mind. What are the perceptions that shape the way you're going about things? What are the assumptions? The assumption of self is a big one. The various perceptions about your relationship to the world, those are also things that you've got to learn how to question. And a good place to start is your relationship to your breath. How do you focus on the breath in such a way that gives rise to well-being? How do you focus on it in a way that gives rise to stress? What's the difference? This is something we look at over and over and over again. It's only when you've been over and over something many times, and John Lee's image is of walking back and forth on a path, that you see the little things on the side of the path you might not have noticed otherwise. The little changes. Certain plants are growing, certain trees are dying, certain flowers are blooming or wilting. Certain animals are crawling across the path or on the side of the path. And if you're preoccupied with other things, you're not going to see these things, no matter how many times you go back and forth. But if you're curious and observant, you see things on the side of the path that weren't there before, and you notice, okay, something's changed, something's up. And particularly, you want to look at your actions. What are the desires that underlie your actions? And we all know that desire tends to be blind. How do you bring some vision to that? So you see not only what you want to see, but you want to, you want to see what's actually going on. And the Buddha gives you lots of detailed instructions as to where to look, what kinds of questions to ask. But you may find that the particulars of your particular situation right now require slightly different questions. They come from the basic ones. It's learning how to tweak them so it's just right for you. But the question is not done in the abstract. It's done focused on what's going on right here, right now, what you're doing right now as you get the mind into concentration. That's the ideal action to look for. Even when you're doing other themes of meditation aside from the breath, <clears throat> there's always the question, what are you doing? When you're contemplating the body, the 32 parts, like we chanted just now, on the days when it's easy to visualize the different parts of the body and say, yeah, that's all there is to the body, why are those different from other days from when you resist it? Or why is it so easy to shift back to your old perception that the body is something good-looking, something attractive? What was the desire that skewed your perceptions? This focus on action is why the Buddha set the Four Noble Truths as his definition for right view. Because as I said, the cause of suffering is an action. The path to the cessation of suffering is an action. This is to keep our minds always in that framework. The problem is even in Buddhist circles, people shift away from that to a more passive view. A couple months ago, when I was working on the book on the path, I was reading other books explaining the Four Noble Truths, explaining the Noble Eightfold Path. And I was struck by how many times when people explain right view that they may make mention of the Four Noble Truths, but they shift really quickly into the three characteristics, saying that the Four Noble Truths are true because things are impermanent. They're unsatisfactory. They're not self. That's the reality out there. And we suffer because we cling to things that change. 
the only implication there is if we didn't cling, then we could still live with things that change and be no problem. And on one level that's true. But that assumption doesn't get us to that place. To get to that place you have to see that the things are changing because your desires are changing. It's not that you're sitting here just misunderstanding the nature of things and trying to force some permanence on things that won't be permanent. Any act of clinging is going to cause suffering. If you cling to the experience of the deathless, you're going to suffer. Another problem with that, basing things on right view on the three characteristics, is that the implication is that, well, if you don't resist change, then you're going to be okay. And then you say, well, just go, f go with the flow. Don't have any fixed views. Allow everything to change. This is sometimes even used to justify changing the Dharma. Of course the Dharma is going to change, but the Buddha didn't regard that as a positive thing. His image was of a drum. The crack develops in the drum, and so he placed a peg in the crack. Another crack develops, place another peg, and eventually the whole drum is nothing but pegs. And it's not going to make the sound that the old drum made. It was one solid piece of piece of wood. Changes in the Dharma don't go in a good direction. So the Buddha's not simply saying, well, learn how to accept change and you'll be okay. He's saying, you are creating things that are changing, and then you're latching on to them. You're clinging to them. In fact, your clinging is creating things from which you suffer. So you've got to turn and look at that action of clinging. And make use of the help that the Dharma gives. Don't try to change the Dharma, because otherwise it's not going to be as helpful. So remember, the basic framework is the Four Noble Truths, and the Four Noble Truths start with actions. Our experience is all based on action. So when there's suffering, you ask yourself, what are the actions that are leading to that? Get the mind still enough so it can see and then know where to look. The problem isn't out there with, with the world. The problem is in here. We play a role in creating our experience, and we forget about it, and we blame the experience. Turn around, look at this part of the mind that's constantly fabricating things in ignorance. Bring some knowledge there through your questions, through your mindfulness and alertness and all the other good qualities you're trying to develop in the concentration. And that's when you get to the root of the matter. And when you get to the root, though, everything falls apart, but it doesn't fall apart in a bad way. It opens up to something that's unfabricated, that won't change, where there's no clinging, no suffering at all. It's like finding the right key and putting it in the right keyhole to unlock things. said everything good will open up. 